Thank you for joining us, Friendship Christian Church Virtual Sunday School Class. This is Lesson 130 of Isaiah. We're in chapter 52, and we'll be beginning in verse 1. Before we get into our lesson, let us have a word of prayer. Father, we just pray that as we go through your word, that you'll guide us and lead us by the Holy Spirit, and that by the Spirit, you'll bring us to proper conclusions. Father, we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, chapter 52. Now, Isaiah in this chapter foresees the millennium, the second coming of Jesus. He foresees that when Jerusalem will once again be a holy city and the uncircumcised, the unclean, will no longer enter her gates. That means anybody that does not belong to Jesus during the millennium will not be able to enter Jerusalem. And a call is given for Zion to awake from her drunkenness and clothe herself in garments of honor and dignity that's provided by the Lord. Zion is a term that's used in the Old Testament for Jerusalem. It's also used in the New Testament for the church. So foreign invaders will no longer control the city of Jerusalem at the time of her restoration by Jesus when he comes. So let's take a look, verse 1. Awake, awake, Zion, clothe yourself with strength. Put on your garments of splendor. Jerusalem, the holy city, the uncircumcised and defiled will not enter you again. God is going to restore Jerusalem. In Israel, Jesus is going to come and sit on King David's throne. Now, this kind of happens, but without Jesus, after they were taken into captivity by the Babylonians. And then the Babylonians were defeated, and then the Israelites were allowed to come back. And they rebuild Jerusalem, and they rebuild the temple. But Isaiah, he he understands that. He sees that. But then he sees way out there. For Isaiah, there's a, there's a coming of the Messiah who's going to restore, restore Jerusalem to a holy city, who's going to sit on King David's throne. Of course, we know that's going to happen way out in the future. That's going to happen telling us in the book of Revelation. That's going to happen after these tribulations and things. So that's still way out in the future. Uh, The Jews were thinking, oh, it's going to happen soon. It's going to happen soon. So they, they had hope and they were strengthened in the knowledge that God is their protector. He is their strength. And so the the, uh, clothe yourself with strength, uh, garments of splendor. The garments of splendor are speaking of garments that will show the world who God is. It could be the garment of holiness. We know that the beautiful garments that the high priest wore uh, were representative of serving God to the people. And the world would be able to look at them and say, oh, you're on God's side. You're you're helping me get in relationship with God. And Jerusalem is the holy city of God. And only believers are going to come in during the millennium. The uncircumcised and defiled are speaking of the worldly people. True believers in Christ are not defiled because their sins are forgiven, and they're not uncircumcised either. They're not physically circumcised necessarily, but believers in Christ are circumcised 
in their hearts. And it's in your heart that Jesus is interested in. It's in your heart that Jesus should be. And Romans uh, chapter 2 verse 29 says this, No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. So with God, in the church, with Jesus, now and in the millennium, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile when each belongs to God as a Christian. A Jew becomes a Christian, a Gentile becomes a Christian, they're equal Christians, even though one would have been circumcised under the law and one wouldn't have. We're all equal in Christ being circumcised in the heart. Verse 2. Shake off your dust, rise up, sit in throne, Jerusalem. Free yourself from the chains on your neck. Daughter Zion, now a captive. Isaiah saw the Babylonian captivity. But Isaiah is also going to see the reign, the rule of the beast, the Antichrist. And how the whole world is being held captive by one world government, one world religion, run by the beast. He's seeing both things. And so their captivity in Babylon had been in a dry and thirsty land. Well, when the Antichrist is here, uh, it's going to be dry and thirsty for Christ, for God, for the word, because it's not going to exist unless they do it underground. And they're, they're being told here, shake off the past, and live for the future. When you come to Christ, shake off your past. Start your future. And the chains on your necks, change of sin, that's your past. They're off, that's your future. They were in chains by the Babylonians, they're off. They will be in chains by the beast, they're off. These bands of bondage will no longer be. And as Christians, we should accept the freedom we have. Back in this day, when they were freed from the Babylonians, they needed to enjoy the freedom they had in God. We should enjoy the freedom we have in Jesus. God in the flesh. Verse 3. For this is what the Lord says. You are sold for nothing. And without money you will be redeemed. Redeemed. The word redeemed means that you were bought right off the slave market. You were on the slave block. Bids being given for your life. You were going to be purchased with money. But you got bought right off of the slave market while the bidding was taking place without money. Without money. You see, Babylon didn't buy their people. They just took them captive. The beast is not going to buy people. He's just going to take them captive. He's going to hold the whole world captive. And we're going to be bought back. We're going to have our freedom from Satan, from evil, from bondage, from slavery to sin without money. There'll be no money exchanging hands. Jesus does it by the blood on the cross. Revelation chapter 5 verse 9 says this, And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchase for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. Way back before 680 BC, Isaiah, Isaiah saw what the book of Revelation chapter 5 verse 9 states. He saw that. 
verse 4. For this is what the sovereign Lord says. At first my people went down to Egypt to live. Lately Assyria has oppressed them. The first time they went to Egypt was voluntary. It was on voluntary on their act because there was a famine worldwide and there was food there. Joseph brought his family there because he had such a high position and there was plenty of food. But later, they were cruelly treated by the new pharaohs and they were in bondage for 400 years. They worked as slaves until God sent Moses to go to that Pharaoh and say, release my people. They were again carried into Egypt by Assyrian kings. And God had to deliver them out from Egypt then because they were held captive. They were captured by the Babylonians after that. And all these things happened because God was teaching them a lesson. Do not worship idols. I'm, I am, I am. I am the only God. Idols are nothings. You need to worship me. You need to live for me. I'm your redeemer. We need to get that straight. We definitely need to know this. When the beast comes. Then in verse 5. And now what do I have here? Declares the Lord. For my people have been taken away for nothing. And those who rule them mock. Declares the Lord. And all day long my name is constantly blasphemed. Now the word mock here is not found in every translation. It is here in the NIV. It is in the NASB. It's not found in every translation. The reason you find it in the NASB, the reason you find it in the NIV, is because the, the scroll that they found, the Dead Sea Scroll, the scroll of Isaiah that they found, had the word mock, not the other words that have been used by all the other translations. So the translators for the NIV, NASB, they went by the Dead Sea Scroll, which those other translators didn't have. They didn't have access to the Dead Sea Scrolls. That didn't come about until 1946, and it, some of these scrolls are still being deciphered. It's been a long time. But by the time uh, the NIV and S NASB came around, uh, the Dead Sea Scroll of Isaiah had been deciphered. It had been translated. And the word mock, it's in there. So that's why they use it. Now this verse, verse 5, is a reference to the Babylonians and their cruelty to the captive Israelites. Foreign rulers despised the God of Israel because they only had one God and they, they, they're, they're idol worshipers. And so God has to deliver them out of bondage, not for their goodness, but for his own sake, for the sake of his holy name, to prove he is the only truthful, faithful, all-powerful God I am. And that God, if he doesn't deliver his people, then he's sowing he doesn't have the power to deliver them, which would really be bad news for, for the idol worshipers. Bad news for the Israelites because there's no God to take care of them. The, the lost are going to stay lost in their idol worship. And the ones who had God are going to lose their faith. No winner. So God has sent them out of captivity to repent and to return, and to live for him. The captivity in all cases was cruel and caused them to cry out to God to help them. And when they repented, God heard them and came to their rescue. 
and then verse 6. Therefore my people will know my name. Therefore in that day they will know that it is I who foretold it. Yes, it is I in that day. Now, after the day of the Lord, when Israel experiences deliverance from the worldwide dispersion, she will recognize the fulfillment of prophecies through Isaiah and others, the other prophets, and enjoy full assurance that the Lord had spoken and fulfilled his promises of deliverance. They will connect these events with the great I am. Now, we still have Jews all over the world. At Jesus' second coming, that dispersion will end. Now, Israel is a Jewish nation right now, and any Jew that wants to can come, get automatic citizenship. But many Jews are still in other countries. They haven't come back to Jerusalem. But one day they will. One day, when Jesus returns and establishes the new Jerusalem, they will all come. The purpose of all this is so that God's people will come to realize who he is. They were spiritual adulterers before their captivity. They were into idol worship. And God teaches them to respect and know his name above all other names by taking them into captivity and rescuing them. The greatest captivity is going to be during the Antichrist. During the tribulation. But Jesus will come and will rescue the world. And the dispersion will be over. It is foretold. God says, it is I who foretold it. Yes, it is I. They will recognize Jesus as I am. Interesting, interesting past history and interesting future coming up. We'll stop it there. We'll pick it up at verse 7 next time. I do want you to uh, read ahead. I do want you to read ancient world history. Get into the book of Revelation. And I want you to study before we come back to verse 7. There's so much connected in there. Uh, let us let us pray. Father, we just thank you for your word, and we just pray that as we read the Old Testament, the New Testament, as we read ancient world history books, as we look at the news today, we just pray that by the Holy Spirit, you allow us to connect the dots and see the full picture of Jesus. Father, we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, and may we all go in peace.